So this morning we're going into Matthew again, um, around Matthew chapter 24, and we'll go right through to probably 26. Last week we talked in Matthew 26, and we talked about Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, where he went into the garden, and we, we learned some principles there of praying and how he prayed, and, and you know that he used the principle there of even the Lord's Prayer. And when he went into the garden, what did he do first? He went in and he fell on his face. He separated himself from people, remember? He fell on his face. He cried out his adoption, Father, help us. He said he petitioned to what he needed. Then he said, not my will, but your will be done. Then he went away and he came back and he prayed a different, if it cannot be taken away, let your will be done. And then he came back and he said, let's get ready to go because our peop- the people are here that are against us. Luke adds something in there and he says that the angel of the Lord came and strengthened him in that time. And so when we're singing out for these things, it doesn't go unnoticed and God will give you the strength as you come. But then it goes on to say that if we have a read in uh, Matthew 26, let's see how... Jesus came and is arrested. Verse 47, it says, While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him with a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and of the elders of the people. Now the betrayer who had arranged a signal for them said, The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Isn't that amazing that Jesus was such a, a normal sort of person going around that people actually had to have someone pick him out? That's pretty good. It's, the Bible says that he had nothing that uh, you would you'd want. You know, like he, he didn't stand out that way any different, you know. And uh, so that's, that's quite interesting. And it said, they're going at once to Jesus. Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, friend, do what you've came for. Come, come, came for. Then the man stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. And so on it goes on. And we see here this morning, I want to speak about betrayed with a kiss. <clears throat> betrayed with a kiss. You know, through life, I don't know, anyone here been betrayed? Somewhere? I mean, you probably haven't lived long enough. Well, you will get betrayed somewhere in life by someone. Someone will do something to you against you where you thought they were friends with a kiss. The world is that way. Even at school, you see it where you have friends at school, but then they come against you because of peer pressure or they, they go against you, you know, in this way. And they're supposed to be your friends. And you see the people put on this face sometimes, and it's awful when it's the closest to you, your family, and your real close friends, that when something happens and they betray your trust or they betray you in some way, that it really rips your heart out, doesn't it? And you just feel awful, you know? Go and get a gun or something. No, you don't do that. But you know, you just feel bad. And do you know what? Jesus was betrayed with a kiss by a friend, just like that. But not only that, you need to understand that we betray Jesus with a kiss. How many times the, the pull of the world and the things that we find hard that the world's got answers for all. We say, Lord, we love you. You're my friend. And then we just turn our back on him so many times or we, we become selfish and do what we want to do and we betray Jesus with our kiss. We need to be careful in our Christian walk because I believe, as I said last week, there are, there are different ways of, of Christian living. There's, you know, there's the word, there's prayer, but there's also the spirit. But there's also worship, there's also submission, there's accountability, there's disciplines as a Christian. And we need to ensure that we live within all these boundaries and we don't betray our Lord with a kiss. In Matthew chapter 24, and it goes through till 25, there's a thing there that's called the pericope. That's the thing you learn in Bible college and that it's the beginning and the end of a theme. And so we have a couple of chapters here of themes. And the theme here is talking about be ready for the end. Don't go to sleep. I'm on my way. It's about us doing what we have to do to ensure that we're there when Christ returns. And the good thing about it, we see even back in Matthew chapter 26, he says to Judas, friend, do what you came to do. Friend. 
He called Jews a friend, even though he betrayed him, he called him a friend. The Bible says that, 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 the, that God says that we're not uh, slaves and servants, but friends. And no matter the times we feel that, you know, we've just let you down or we feel bad and things like that, understand that he still loves you and, and you're his friend. You can always run back to him with open arms like the prodigal son. That's the beauty of it. But in Matthew 24, verse 12, it talks about the signs of the ages. It says that the love of many will grow cold, but he who stands till the end will be saved. Now, through these chapters, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who are believers. They're not talking to the unsaved. It says many will, of their love will just wax cold. And we need to be people to, to guard our, our, our feelings and our love towards other people in the world and towards God. Many times you see injustices and things done and how bad people are in the world and, you, and sometimes it's easily to get sort of a bit hard about them and just say they deserve what they get. And, you know, oh, uh, instead we should be loving towards them and understand that God loves them and, and created them just like you and I. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. There's, there's a discipline, there's a, there's a responsibility as Christians, not just to get your fireproof and your fire insurance and say, I'm right, Jesus Christ, mutual life. Not that. It's about what you have to do and we have to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul spoke of. In Matthew 24, 45 to 51, it talks about keeping watch for the hour that the Lord will return. It speaks about the wicked servant. Don't be like the wicked servant that says the master's been away so long, then he starts living as the world. And then when the master comes back, he gets punished for what's happened or he loses what was given to him. We need to be careful because, you know, right from the beginning when Christ was crucified and rose again and he said, I'll be back, people have been expecting his return. Is it tonight? Is it tomorrow? In 1900, they sold all the houses and things like that and said, we're going home. And then people it didn't happen and people were shooting themselves and committing suicide. It's in history. It happens all the time. 2000 bug, millennium bug. Woo, go to the hills. Jesus is coming. All this stuff happens. Now we've got the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the new season. Jesus is coming and he is coming and it could be now. It's eminent. We've got to live as if it's eminent. It could be right now. It could be before. It, uh, we could just disappear right now. Are we ready? Are we ready to meet our maker? Are we ready to meet Jesus? Are we ready to meet God for him to say, what have you done with my son? Have you lived a good life? Have you lived a life that I've asked you to live? Have you gone out and witnessed to people? Have you spread your good news of the gospel? That's why Monday nights we're starting next month. We have to begin to equip us all to get out there. Matthew 25, verse 5, it talks about the bridegroom. And again, it talks about the bridegroom coming and the, and the virgins that are waiting for him. And it says there that there was a time that they were coming. He, he had a delay. And they became all drowsy. They all fell asleep. Those without the oil and those with the oil, they all fell asleep. It's a picture of the church today, folks. The church around the world is asleep and we need to rise up and awake. It's time to trim our lamps and be ready all the time for the Lord's return. It's like when we're walking on fire, yeah, Holy Ghost, it's great. And then we start to get drowsy and tired and we don't want to do it anymore. And then I don't really want to go to the church today and oh, Wednesday night connect group, forget it. I'm so tired. Work, busyness of life, got to mow the yard, got to do this and all that. And we put the Lord separately and betray him with a kiss. We must continue as Christians to make sure that God is the number one. I spoke to the centurions yesterday as we had our breakfast. And I said to him, I said, what is the most important thing for your life? What gets you out of bed? What motivates you? And they all said, God, to serve God. 
And as we serve God, my family comes in order, our business comes in order, and everything comes in order. But we long every day to wake up and say, what's on? I'm wondering if that's what you like. It's time for the church to re-engage. Don't give up and don't get tired. Don't let the world and the pressures of the world and the time restrictions and the full time, the overtime, the, the work, 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 and not enough time. We've had the same time 100 years ago. And we, we say we're just so tired and we're so busy. We cannot afford to come out another night, Pastor. I closed Sunday nights because we could have the night off so we could be involved with one night a week, just one, somewhere in a connect group, somewhere getting involved. Because I believe we have to tie that time too. 24 hours a day, 2.4 hours in the day, what are we doing for God? You know, I always found in my Christian life if I always put God first, even when I'm the tiredest, absolute tiredest, there's times I say, I don't want to come to church today. She says, you're the pastor, you've got to come. But no, <laughs> there's times in my life I'm so tired and I don't want to go out at night and whatever. And I'm sick last week. I was sick. I was in bed Friday and Saturday. I was crooked and I come and preach on Sunday. You know, you've got to push through. And when you push through, you know what? God gives you the strength. So many times I've been down here and absolutely had it and I couldn't do it. And I come up here and I'm, and then I get back down there. I'm, it's amazing what God does it all the time. And I'll tell you what, I've seen it so many times, staying up at night. And, and you think, oh, pastor, I've got to work a full-time job. It's not like you. Hello, I work probably more hours than most of you. And the thing is, is that when I work at night or whatever else, I stay up and I say, God, you have to refresh me tomorrow because I can't. And do you know what? Every time I get up in the morning, it's ding, 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 sometimes before the alarm, I'm ready to go. And you know what? If you put God first, he will make sure your body is in order. You understand? But there's got to be a balance there too. Don't go silly and work overwork for it because then you burn out and you hate church and hate God and hate everything else. There's a balance in everything in life, is there not? So let's be balanced Christians, but let's live for Jesus. See, it's no good trying to find the oil to flame your lamp when you haven't really took the oil with you and you let the oil go. The oil's the thing that sustains us, the anointing, the, the Spirit of God living within us. And if we don't refocus on the things of God and we don't work for the things of God out of love, not out because we have to, our fire goes down and anointing reduces. And then we find ourselves... Asleep with everybody else. Jesus comes back. Ooh. Oh, quick, where's my anointing? Oh, I left it a few months ago somewhere. It's too late. When you need it, what are you going to draw upon to light your flame? It begins with now, preparation now, guys. What's going to happen tomorrow you should have been preparing for before. You don't know what's going to happen, but you know by this. Yeah. Matthew 25, it goes on, talks about the talents. What the Lord's given you and you trusted you with, you're responsible for to increase and grow. That's why we're calling our Wednesday night group the Meat Lovers. Yeah, hey, that's a good name. No pizza, it's just meat. So we're going into the deep things of God and we want to be taught by the best in the world of some deep revelations of God. Because we, we just don't want milk. It wasn't a milk cow, was it? It was a bull, wasn't it? It was a milk cow. Get that off. Put the bull on because I don't want milk. All right? I just want the meat. Meat lovers. Get involved Wednesday nights, great funny. We have coffee and everything. But get Friday nights, there's one. There's lots of things. The over 50s, don't tell me you can't get connected in this place. If you get connected, you're in, you, don't, you haven't got connected, you're, you're an island. You don't want to be connected. And that's wrong. <laughs> because Christianity is not about an island, it's about body, community, growth together, make an impact collectively to make an impact in the world. Is it not?